new tools and techniques in school travel data collection and analysis. Um, I'm really pleased to introduce today's presenters. We have Armie de Francia, de Francia, sorry, uh, school travel planning facilitator at Green Communities Canada. Uh, Jamie Hilland, Program Manager, Active and Safe Routes to School Program, Green Communities Canada, and Mike Smith, who's a partner at Haste, Help for School Active Travel. No. <laughs> uh, so the context wow. just for this presentation that uh, is school travel planning is a community-based approach that has been used with success to increase the number of children choosing active transportation modes to get to and from school. It works to uncover the transportation challenges faced by school communities and identify the resources and strategies necessary to overcome them. The process follows five steps generally, program setup, data collection and uh, problem identification, active uh, action planning, implementation, and ongoing monitoring. So the following presentations focus primarily on data collection and problem identification. Uh, each speaker will speak for about eight minutes or so, and then after the three have spoken, we'll take uh, questions from the audience afterwards. Mm -hmm. Everybody, thanks for coming. Um, just to clarify, I'm actually with the Green Action Center, uh, much to Clifford Chagrin, who is the uh, director of Green Communities Canada. I do not work there. Um, but uh, maybe one day, Clifford, you never know. Yeah. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, sort of the, uh, a unique program that we've developed uh, over the last couple of years that we found to be highly effective uh, in engaging schools and drawing them into uh, the school travel planning process. Um, so our app, as you can see, is uh, called Bike Rock Roll. So we're going to talk a little bit about what we've done and how our little software program works and just might change the world. So a common challenge that we're finding, and this is a uh, common in the, is there any American friends from here? No, put up your hands, don't be shy. Lots. Okay, great. So the Safer School Program is well established in the United States, as most of you know. I presented at the conference back uh, in Columbus in April. And a lot of the, the uh, frustration I heard was about the onerous nature of the forms that they had. There were pages and pages that they had to do. Has anybody ever done a safe home survey from uh, safe school? No? Well, okay, yeah. there we go. I have a hand in the back. Yes. So they are quite long. And so the challenge we were having is that we would uh, give all these forms out and our return rate was in the single digits often for the number of parents who were getting them. So we sat down and we said, how can we get a fast, easy way to do it so that we're getting more schools just participating and collecting more data? And we know teachers are crunched for time, but we know that school is also sort of a path of audiences, and so we can really tap into that. So we've designed it so that it's, uh, for teachers, they simply log on to the site, bikewalkworld.org. Uh, they find the school on the map, then they do a simple hands-up survey. So let's do a quick one today. I, I could generate a score if I was on the site, but we won't need to. How many of you walked here today? Good percentage. How many, how many of you biked here today? Love to see that. And how many drove in private vehicles? We had a full room full, but I'll take it. Good, that's a high percentage. So judging on that, your combined bike rock score would probably be about 95%. Uh, and so it generates that score for the school, and they can look at it. So as you can see, you can see the scores here generated on sort of a, a grid pattern. So we have allocated colors to it. And this is sort of a good way to incentivize schools to move from sort of a red, which is a low mode share uh, in terms of active travel, up to a green mode share. So this map here, as you can see, this is a map of Winnipeg, and uh, this is really before we started promoting our program extensively as much as we could. Uh, we got funding last year from Heart and Stroke Foundation to conduct a two-year study of transportation modes and to the school because really we didn't have an idea. We have na some national data and some international data on like what the actual uh, mode share is, but we don't have any regional data for us. So we, 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 struggled, we struggled really uh, with that lack of knowledge because we can't go in and advocate something if we don't know what it actually exists at. So we're doing a, a big province-wide campaign. So this is before we did uh, the, the push here. Uh, and then you can see this is one of our schools that we did. It's actually my kid's school, uh, that two of my kids go. Um, and you find the school. And what it does, which is quite nicely and gets schools going, is it generates a score. Uh, a graph on the bottom right generates a score on the, on the bottom left there. And it gives you a breakdown of the score. So this is just one classroom that submitted their scores. It gives you nearby schools, so we've been tied into sort of GIS framework. And it also taps into that spirit of competition, is something we find, is that um, among schools, they really want to try and outdo each other having the best walk score or best bike walk roll score. So you can see I live in a pretty uh, active community. Uh, over half of our children walk or bike to school every day. We'd like to get that number up, obviously, but we'll take it as a starting point. And that's without us doing any sort of programming interventions uh, at this time. This is the survey itself. 
Um, there's five mode shares that we have on it. Uh, we're looking at expanding that because we know that some people walk part way or bike get or driven part way and, and dropped off. Uh, we know there's other mode shares too. We do accommodate uh, people that are in wheelchairs, and we actually get a fair amount of those that are wheeling their way to school. Hmm. This is from a sample from uh, this spring. It's really a simple hands-up <coughs> survey. You enter the data, it's 30 seconds, and away you go. And that's been the real power for it. So we talked a little bit about sort of community engagement and politics, and we all know that Copenhagen's amazing, and we'd all love to live there. Why are kids important? So it's the Copenhagenizer Index. You guys are probably a lot large group, largely familiar with this one. We would like to work our scores in such a manner that we, we can be compared for school travel as we can for the Copenhagenizer Index. So this is again, we're tapping into the spirit of competition. Um, this is where uh, we talk about a bit about how Germany had the highest winter uh, medal of account, right? And that was in 1924. When Canada, the Vancouver Games in 2010, how many medals did we win? A lot, right? Because we said that we really wanted to change that. This is what we're looking at for children cycling to school right now. Pretty dismal numbers, although for our American friends, we are doing better here. <laughs> <laughs> just had to say it, just had to say it. It's after that competition. Uh, yeah, twice as much, that's right, Mike. But uh, we do want to work on those numbers for sure. We're in much the same boat as you in comparison to European countries, so that's something we've definitely got to work on. And so what do people want? And that's what they want is the data. Uh, again, we can't really do uh, much in terms of arguing until we have that data in hand. So the power of Bike Rock World is it's available, it's open source, you can compare your score to any other school in the world. Uh, I don't know if I have a current map on here, but we uh, have hundreds and hundreds of schools from across the globe now participating. We did a count in May of this year in Manitoba, and at one shot we had 157 schools submit their scores. All those schools are now engaged in discussions with us about how they can change their mode share. It's a powerful tool to get them in. Is it the be all and end all? Does it give you the heat maps and the mode share? Which is stuff that my cohorts were talking about, which is also something we want to play. No, it doesn't, but is it a great starting point for that conversation? Absolutely. Does it give you some hard data? Yes, it does. So, this is just to shame us again as North American countries. This is a little school in uh, Olu. So, this is in the middle of winter. Their, boat, their bike mode score is 100. <laughs> so we've got some work to do from cultural. They're in northern climate. They're up near the Arctic Circle. So for all of you saying that they're maritime necessarily, no, they got a lot of snow and it was pretty cold. And that's the kids that did it. Wow. So no problems. They can be done. So this is some of the data that we've collected when we did a coordinated count. We have pages and pages of data. And that, each one of those lines represents a teacher that's engaged in having that discussion with their kids. Part of participation of, in this count is the discussion that we're sparking, simply by participating. We managed in that campaign to collect 15% of our, our province-wide population, which is more data than we collected in 10 years prior. So we were pretty happy with the results. It increases our brand name and increases that discussion over active travel for schools. So on February 22nd, we do that. And within 30 seconds, you can see we had much more data. If you look at the top left, we had two divisions that signed on to, and all their schools to commit. So Louis Rail School Division is in the bottom right. That was 39 out of 41 schools. And Seven Oaks is in the top left there, and they had 22 of 24 schools to participate. And it really needs that you can see a lot of reds. We're getting 30% mode share for some of them. Uh, we had one that were in single digits. Most kids are being driven. Uh, we had a great speech by the, the superintendent in Seven Oaks last week when we were presenting to them about how kids beyond 1.2 kilometers for lower grades and kids beyond 1.6 are bust, and they still have 40% being driven. Those are kids that can easily walk 1.2 to 1.6. It's pretty powerful data. So what do we want to do? Where do we want to go? So we want to try and make it really the home for active school travel. We want to have gamification. We want to upload pictures. We want to load up school travel plans into it so that when schools log on, they can look back. The challenge we've often had is we do these wonderful multi-year school travel plans, and then we take the files and we shove them away, and they don't get acted upon. This one keeps you up to date and keeps you current because you'll know your mode score beyond that survey of three or four years ago. It keeps that spirit of competition going, and it keeps those schools wanting to do it. We're already starting to see that result. I'll talk about that then. <laughs> These are some of our achievements that we want to make happen. 
uh, for our, uh, is my face still here? No. We, we were talking about Belgium a little while ago, so we're going to try and model a bit off their model. And then we also have a great app if you want to check it out called CounterPoint. It's a simple citizen count traffic <coughs> counting app. You draw a line in the road, you measure mode share by traffic, uh, by bike, by car, by bus, uh, and you can uh, submit that to your city planners, and it's also pretty powerful data. Uh, and we also want to do mappable surveys, so we're talking more heat maps, like Mike will probably talk about. And how you can help, spread the word, talk about it, get people to do it. Uh, you can hit us up, we're Green Action Center, active and safe for the school program. I'm on Twitter as Jamie Hillen. Thanks for your time. My name is Mike smith Cairns, and I'm going to be talking a little bit uh, as to where Jamie took off all this data uh, that uh, is collected and sort of what we're doing with it now uh, at HASTE. So HASTE is a uh, workers' cooperative, and we've been in the business for about eight years, and our mandate is to connect kids, schools, and communities through walking and cycling. So. What exactly do we do and how do we do it when it comes to the data we collect and then the information uh, we put into uh, our maps and our programming, et cetera. And I'm going to take you through uh, some of the, um, the new methods that we've developed into our Best Roots to School maps, as well as some new methods that we've developed into our uh, traffic concerns sheet, data sheet, uh, that helps uh, prioritize things. I'm going to use an example of a school in Coquitlam, uh, which is a suburb of about 35 minutes sky train east of here, uh, to provide some sort of uh, storyline as well. So Jamie did a hands-up survey. I was going to ask you guys as well. But, um, this is the survey we send home to schools. And generally, do you think kids or adults are more honest people? <laughs> that's a question. Yes. 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 Absolutely. And that's why we send it home, or that's why we send it to the schools for the kids to answer it. So like Jamie did, you know, we've got all the list of, of modes, and then that gives us a pretty good snapshot of how the kids got to school that day. When they do that over the course of a week, um, they can incorporate it into curriculum, etc. On top of that, we send home family uh, surveys. And this was a hybrid version. A lot of schools now doing it online, so we, we put it up on our website. But these are the questions that dig into the nuts and bolts of the travel culture that we're trying to unearth. And what they look like is something like, you know, what are the main reasons your, your children are usually driven to school? So we ask the drivers, you know, I would allow my child to walk if this was the case. So we provide some um, options and then it gives us an understanding of what the barriers are uh, psychologically and also uh, we ask infrastructure questions, um, so physically as well. So we're collecting the quantitative, the qualitative, again, to really sort of understand what the school travel culture is uh, before we go in and do any actual planning. So new to us is a, a, a process that we've now implemented that we can hand to all our facilitators who are operating all over Metro Vancouver and BC, uh, where we can start to get a better picture of what the traffic concerns are, uh, but really what families are telling us. So this is just a snapshot of a list of a um, family survey comments that we get back. So we now have a process where we go through each and every one and we start to prioritize uh, what those uh, comments are telling us. And that, again, that gives us the nice quantifiable um, data that we collect through the, uh, the subjective comments. And of course, when you scroll through down through here, you get, uh, you know, if anyone's done this, it's, it can be a tedious, boring process. But then you get to these diamonds in the rough where one mother says, I'm now a city councillor who campaigns strongly on improving traffic safety around schools. I am a huge advocate of this work you are doing and would like to help out in any way. 
podcast. <laughs> Talking a lot about finding champions within the school, like there was our champion. So uh, her name was Terry Towner. She's still a counselor in, in Coquitlam. And I'll, uh, I'll talk more about that. So in this case, we had about 200 responses, consolidated it down uh, to something that was much more feasible. And what we do is we came up, sometimes we call it our top 10 list, but it, it could be more or less. But these are the top three uh, traffic concerns that were reported from those family surveys uh, for Montgomery Middle School. So Austin Avenue got a score of 26, was the highest. The major arterial north of the school, the issues were vehicle speeds, uh, sidewalks being too small, and one intersection in particular, cars not paying enough attention to pedestrians. Monday Road, score of 22. Edgewood Avenue, score of 10, and down the list it goes. So we're now able to, uh, in conjunction, you know, with talking to the principals, to the PACs, um, to the other community groups, we're, st we're starting to now see a, a better picture of, uh, of what the school is telling us in terms of how they're getting around. And of course, we do it to avoid things like this. Does anyone know what I'm getting at here? I'm a concern. <laughs> just, just hearing the one voice loud. Exactly. It's not the, the actual hidden example. So this is the concerned parent who lives, you know, five kilometers from the school, drives every day. His kids actually don't go to school anymore. <laughs> you know, when, he drives, when he's reversing out his, his driveway, there's an overgrown vegetation that blocks his view, right? So he shows up to the pack and he, well, we can say, you know, sir, in fact, do you live on Austin Avenue or Mundy Road or Edgewood or all the other lists? It's like, well, no. Like, well, you're not, you know, you're not God. <laughs> and we bring out this quote. <laughs> you want to come to the table, bring the data. And that's what we'd like to, to think we bring <laughs> to the table. I like that. We're not that mean. Uh, changing gears a little bit. Um, so that was all the data we collected from the surveys and how we've, uh, we feel like we've done a better job at consolidating it and uh, making it more accurate uh, for when we develop our best routes to school maps. So this is what uh, parents would get on a family take-home survey, and we ask them to map their route to school um, if they were to walk a bike. And what we get uh, from that are a whole bunch of other information. We sometimes school districts give us the data. They say here are all the where all the kids live. Go ahead and do it, and we use that information. But sometimes they don't, so we have to make our own maps. So with uh, the surveys that we get back, we're able to um, get an idea of where the kids are starting from. So we can then uh, what we've done, and this is a new process. We use, um, you know, incorporate GIS into the mapping, and we layer the maps so that uh, it's a scatter map, and we can sort of start to begin to see where the concentrations of students are coming from. We had another layer where we start to saturate the routes. You can see the most popular routes are in deep, dark red, and they're sort of lighter as they become less popular. But now we can start to see. Um, you know, sort of like a drain or a funnel into the school, where students are coming from and where we might have to concentrate uh, our programming, etc. Side note, all these maps that you're seeing yeah, you, yeah, um, are produced by Jones Map. Sandra, can I raise your hand? Yes. <laughs> They're wonderfully designed maps and uh, always effective. And we get to then the third map, uh, which is the walkabout, or the third version of the map, which is the walkabout map. So we get, we hand this sheet to all the folks who come on our school walkabout. And the school walkabout is an opportunity for us to go around the school and look at all these places with stakeholders, parents, students, etc. So we've got our three layers on this map. We've got <laughs> our top traffic concerns along the, the legend. 
and then we've got all the other pieces of the map that the city wants to move through. So we use this map, and we you know usually uh, go see three or four spots. Gives us a very good idea of uh, of what the issues are, and then it also helps develop our action items. So going back to Councillor Towner, who wanted to start a pedestrian flag program uh, along Monday Road, and these were the crosswalks here. So before the survey data came in, you know, great idea. Is it valid? In this case, absolutely. Lots of kids using this street, especially coming along this crosswalk, speeding roads. If anyone has experience implementing a pedestrian crosswalk flag program, does anyone know what I'm talking yeah. about? Yeah. So you grab the flags from the sidewalk, you use them as uh, beacons of hope. <laughs> across the walk or across the street. Uh, if you do, I'd love to chat with you because uh, where it's about to happen. And finally, uh, the last version. This is um, Montgomery hasn't finished their final version, so I brought out another map. Uh, this is the final best first to school map that gets uh, incorporated with a pamphlet of information about uh, safe walking and pedestrian um, information. And this is printed and goes home uh, to families in the early school year so they can start to develop their travel choices early before they, uh, they start to think about that stuff. And in terms of how these methods have improved our work, so we can send these maps home now um, that are thoroughly surveyed, they're effectively mapped, and they result in a form of communication to families uh, that is accurate and trustworthy. And at the end of the day, that provides more options for families uh, to choose when they're choosing uh, how to get to school and, and beyond. Okay, I'll pass it over to Arthur. My name is Arby Zafrasia and I am a school travel planning facilitator at Green Communities Canada. So for those of you who are, are not that familiar with us, we are a national association of community organizations who work towards reducing our impact on the environment. And we have an active and safe routes to school initiative which falls under our Canada Walks department. And we've been developing the Canadian school travel planning model uh, for more than a decade. And the first 10 years were focused on expanding the model from three schools in Toronto to becoming a province-wide initiative. Mm -hmm. And then after that, we focused more on working with our active and safe school partners in other provinces to creating a more national initiative. And the school travel planning has been implemented in every province and territory. So now to the good stuff. I'll be introducing you to our new benefits and cost ratio tool. For a bit of background, there was a previous study on the benefits and costs um, of doing school travel planning done in 2014, and it projected a ratio of 1.8 over 11, uh, 11 years for 19 schools. However, this did not include the, the cycling benefits and also the costs were entered on a recall basis. So flash forward to 2015, where we actually developed a tool that would allow facilitators or anyone like myself to enter the cost on an ongoing basis. And then we also included the cycling benefits. And it, it ended up project, projecting a higher benefit cost ratio for a period of less than a year. So for anyone who's curious, we used our figures for measuring the economic benefits of uh, cycling and walking from these two articles. Hmm. Now, to actually use the tool would require three tools in total, uh, but if you just want to measure the benefits and costs of a project at one school, then you'd only need two of these. And the classroom surveys were shown earlier. So, why don't I show you how to use Now why don't we 
we use the mode share that we had from Jamie's presentation? So I believe 10 people raised up their hands for walking, and I think there was 26 of us, so that's what I was counting earlier. And then I believe there was five of us who said they biked, so we could just use that for now. So this helps to determine the benefits. So let's just say it's the same for from school trips. Let's take one on back. So that determines the benefits, and then we divided the cost into two categories. So there's the cost of people, and then there's the cost of materials. Okay, so I'd like to get to know our audience for a bit, and I know there's people here from a variety of backgrounds. How many people here are within, uh, let's see, uh, the planning field? Raise your hand if you're in the planning field. Okay, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And how many people here are from uh, the public health sector? One, two, three, four, five. Excellent. Okay. Is there anyone here from engineering? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay. And is there anyone here from a community organization or just general neighborhood work? Advocacy? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Cool. Alright. So if this were one of our interventions, if this workshop right here, one of our interventions, then the tool would take into account the time that you um, allocate to the project. So that's what the cost of people is. And if you go to this tab, hours detail, it shows the different phases where you can enter in the number of hours people spend at each event. And then the configuration tab actually puts a monetary value to that. These are average figures, but you could adjust it based on whatever is more appropriate. And then over here, this is how we calculate. These are the economic benefit costs, and um, also a, a few assumptions that we make as well. So then the other category is the cost of materials. So that would be things like renting out this venue or um, the PowerPoint projector or anything like that, or even prizes that we give out or infrastructure changes that we have. So again, this is done. This is divided into different parts of the process. And for those of you who would uh, really like a very detailed analysis of it, or if you'd like to compare providers for um, evaluating and deciding next year how to save costs, it allows you to um, enter details on how much it costs per unit, and then enter in the number of units. Um, so let's say it's $40 for four liters of Starbucks, um, and you buy uh, for those, it's probably a lot cheaper than that. But anyway, so it would calculate it right here. So there's a function that calculates that. And then if you have a general figure, let's say you don't really know the individual cost, but you know you spent $200 just to uh, buy all these prizes for an event, then you could just simply enter that in as well. So then, that's the end of it. Oh, once you have all those figures, then It'll yield, there we go, some mode share, change of mode share two, as well as the values. For the sake of time, we'll move on to the multiple skills tool. Okay. So the multiple schools tool, is this big enough for everyone, by the way, or is it oh, super nice? It's going off onto the curtain. Sorry, I think. Yeah, that's a bit. All right. 
Okay. So once you're done with the individual schools file, um, then you would plug in the answers for the mode share there. Uh, the population is also really important. And then you plug in the cost of the people and the materials onto this tab. And it's all color coded so that you can enter it in. So then the benefits and costs of one year. And then on this summary tab, it'll show the results by individual school over here. So if you move along, you'll see the monetary benefits and then the actual benefit cost ratios for um, one year. And for three years and five years, and that's basically just an estimate, we assume that it'll be that the cost of implementation will reduce as time goes by. And then below is where you can do more of a macro analysis. So the far left is more on the mode share. Maybe I'll just show the example. Okay. Yeah, so. There we go. Okay. So then. Here in the middle, this is where you will find the environmental and health benefits. And then further down, this is where you actually find the benefit cost ratio. Okay. So that is where we are at. And we still have a bit to go with the tool. Uh, so the tool we have now, it only allows you to input data for up to two data collection periods. And when it comes to surveying in general, you have to consider that there's maybe some other factors that could impact the results. Maybe there's a construction going on at the time or um, some, uh, some storm hits during that week or whatever. Uh, the other thing is that it assumes that the student population remains constant. But otherwise, we're looking into ways to um, improve this tool. And it is widely available on our website, safecruisesschool.ca, in the meantime. And we welcome your feedback on how we can improve it. So thank you so much. And feel free to contact me at this, at, the, at uh, my email or your Twitter. OK, um, can you facilitate the questions, or do you guys just want to put up your hands, maybe, and then you guys can Sure. Select. So I'm just curious about survey participation, per particularly with parent surveys. How have you distributed them? How do you incentivize them? How's the response been? Um, so it uh, it varies considerably amongst uh, school districts and, and schools uh, specifically. Um, the uh, the gatekeeper is the principal. Find out what. Uh, you know how to do it. How do you run the show at the school? Um, whether they do paper, or they prefer paper take-home surveys. Uh, you know they respond better to that, or are they going more online now, which a lot of schools are. Uh, we find the, for example, the example that I had was a hybrid. So we sent home a paper map uh, to the families with a, a letter, and then it had a link on the on the letter, and then they went and did the online survey. Um, for us, it makes it a lot easier because we're not, you know, printing out all this paper and sending it out. Uh, but it still gives the students something tangible to go home with and sit down with their with their family and fill out the the roots and stuff. Um, we tend to get uh, for the family uh, take home surveys that we administer. Um, we have a 30% baseline that or minimum baseline that we would like to see. Again, we get up to you know eighty percent, all the way down to two percent sometimes, depending on the school. Um, but I think first and foremost, you you chat with the school administration to find out um, you know how the surveys play out best at that school. Um, it's I think one of the reasons that this is so, such a niche area still is because no one wants to go and work with schools in that way. Uh, but we're bold and brave. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> we tend to, we tend to work well. Do you have anything to add on that? Oh, 
I was going to echo much the same sentiments. We just start throwing around a 30% number. That's sort of what we're seeing on average, and we can have that wide variation. Sometimes it's 80. A lot of families are preferring to do the, the survey monkey styles or just the quick surveys like that. But really, as Mike gets to, when we want to do an in-depth one, we want to know where they're coming from and where are those barriers factor transportation, and we can't do that without that data. So uh, much the same. So I'm from Seattle, and we have, you know, use a lot of these tools, but it's income that really determines who's answering these surveys, even including the hands-up surveys. The teachers there are just so stressed they don't want to give the hands-up surveys, and so you're missing, you know, 50% of the population by... So I'm just wondering what your tools are for, for, for dealing with kind of equity. I'd say some of that we've, like, a lot of the schools that we surveyed are quite depressed inner city schools in Winnipeg. Mm -hmm. um, and we have this, a lot of the same socioeconomic issues that you'll see in big American cities. And really, you're still going to have those teachers, and it's a 30-second survey, so that at least gets them engaged. Um, teachers we found uh, will do 30 seconds, or they'll have the student leadership do it as well. It's a good discussion point for it. We found it works in our model. Does it work everywhere? Can't say that, but we've had great success. With well, it. I could add to that. So another approach that we do is that sometimes we'll have a facilitator go in and do the surveys and uh, with with the principal's consent, obviously. And sometimes we'll have the principal have a staff meeting to tell about about the importance of it and uh, how to actually do the surveys. And then the principal may even come and check in to make sure that they do them, um, assuming that they're willing. And sometimes we have uh, student leaders, as Jamie mentioned, who would, or a parent volunteer who would go into the classrooms and do the surveys. Often, too, I can just add to that, uh, we've had success going into schools where it's been a lower socioeconomic situation, and it's often immigrants, it's often a language barrier. Uh, so sending something like this home is a total, is a total wash. Uh, what we do is go into a classroom um, and run the students through the survey because they're often the best English speaker at home. And then have them start to fill out the survey and then take it home to their parents and, and get them to take them through it. Uh, and that gives it a, a, you know, a student bend and also uh, a much better explanation for families. So we've had success in doing that as well. Okay. Um, I found that um, when we were doing the parent survey, um, Alexis Park Elementary in Vernon is kind of like our inner city school and we sent the, the survey home and we got like 16 surveys out of this of a population of about 275 kids mm -hmm. so what I did was um, I talked to the principal about it and I went during their parent teacher interviews and I set up a booth and I gave out grab bags to the parents I said okay here's the survey here and they filled it up they, they actually filled out the survey while they were waiting to talk to the teacher. And we had 186 surveys returned. And I, what I did is I went to two parent-teacher interview days. I went from noon till 8 p.m. both days. Mm -hmm. And the incentive, if they turned back the survey, they got a little grab bag. Mm -hmm. And it was like, you know, I walk little cinch bag with some reflectors and stuff like that. And that was kind of like the incentive for them to actually do the survey. Back there. Yep. Uh, I may have missed this information, but with yes. the heat map showing the most popular common routes to school, how do you collect that information? So, uh, with regards to the Montgomery map there, that was information that <coughs> parents had uh, mapped their route to school. So we had about 200 maps, separate maps. We had someone go in with each map and layer it in, in GIS, and uh, and then as those layers kept going, like piling up, to start to see the concentrations. So to add to that one, we've also found a, a nice easy way sometimes is the postal code survey as well. And so our last STP as well will give us some indication, and it's actually quite dramatic, as Mike showed on the graph, at identifying what those barriers are. Okay, so for those who aren't as bold and brave, or as sophisticated, um, if you're just starting, let's say, as a parent volunteer, yeah. and you want to start collecting some data, and the school's not interested in data yet, yeah. but you have to bring forth the da data, what survey do you think you can recommend to start with for, for some research-based evidence on a very um, simple... Without the, you guys can jump in on me on this one, but in sort of my opinion, without the school administration being complicit with you, it's quite difficult to actually get that done because you just sent, simply won't have access to ask those questions of the students. Um, so I would say that would probably be my starting point. 
Uh, if you want to just say, let's do a simple hands-up survey to start, to spark that discussion, then that's great. Then you would hopefully get them to the point where they would redo school travel planning, and that's a further multi-year in-depth study that truly looks at your barriers. But try and engage them at some point. Yeah, maybe it's not a family take-home survey you start with. It's a, maybe it's a hands-up survey, and that might be easier to get into the schools and convince the principal to say, hey, can I you know, as a PAC member, go in and, and survey, you know, half the classes in a morning. And, and that gives you a pretty good snapshot. Like I said, kids are a lot more honest than, than parents uh, most of the time, especially when it comes to travel behavior. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that may be a good start for you, or a much easier start than trying to administer a, an entire family take-home survey. Yeah, I hope I can explain this, but I think it's too much detail. Um, within your work, I see an application that's slightly different for what was a massive problem for some pretty serious advocacy that was going on that I was involved in. I'm sort of retired out of it, but people are still working on it. So 10th largest school system in the U.S., number one bus system in the U.S., much significantly larger than right now, okay? So how to get the data and actually make a picture of what's going on? because. Okay, and they would allow counting. Okay, so this many kids walk like that, that, that. Okay, so over here you have all this other information. But what you really need to know is the kid who walked, what was their actual choices? Because each kid who walked, some of them, they may have walked because they had a sidewalk. Well, forget the kid who walked. The kid who was dropped off, what was their choice? Did they get dropped off because they lived 100 yards away? Or did they get dropped off and leave a seat empty on a bus? Or did they get dropped off when they were a hazard walker, hazard bus student, which they then, they had been given a hazard seat, but they didn't take up anyway, and they got dropped off. So there's three, you know, there's three drop-off scenarios there. Yeah. And buried inside all of those things is enormous money because the school system is double and triple providing for a child and nobody can express it right because the school system is expanding kiss and rides why are they expanding kiss and rides for children they also gave hazard seats to so they're operating buses and these kids live in some cases across the street we have people who get who qualify for buses to cross the street get dropped off, have a seat on a bus. So buried inside everything, yeah. we cannot get to this. School system is like, oh, we don't know how many are hazard bus. Yeah. You can't, or you know, you know what I'm talking about, yeah. right? Yeah. And buried inside this is trying to get an expression of, well, if we spend 100,000 on fixing the hazard, instead of expanding the kiss and ride, yeah. And then getting rid of the bus, yep. that's much cheaper. Yeah. Instead of forever operationally providing, and then actually keeping track of the hazard child, yep. then when you do fix the sidewalk, how do you find them inside the system and get them back out of the bus? Yep. You know, like all this, you know what yeah. I'm talking about. I okay? think, I mean, I think what you're getting at is, I mean, we just looked at a very piece yep. of the bigger picture. Mm -hmm. So school travel planning yep. is the process uh, that we and it goes from surveying to uh, walkabouts and uh, action plans. Um, so we find the problems such as that, you know, and it's so dynamic sometimes, it's so complicated. You know, there's parents up in Coquitlam that will pay $2,000 for a parking space next to the principal so they can drop off your kid with school. Like, that's so odd. Uh, but it, it's true. So you have these, like, you have the, you have all these dynamics working at one, uh, at a drop off, essentially. And it's incredibly, it's incredibly challenging. Um, but the process, the school travel planning process, is set up in a way that it, it exposes those issues, and then it delegates those uh, issues to be solved by the people who are best to solve them. The engineers or planners or counselors or RCMP, etc., or cops, you know, like that gets delegated. 
So the problems are so messy, but this, the process itself is is proven successful okay. in, in fun. So there's enough information. See, that's the thing. We can see the issue, can't expose the issue yeah. in it's numbers. Better. Because of an in it, people not letting you get quite enough information. We we'll do a quick add on that yeah. one is that we often encounter how much the, our school divisions are spending on busing and planning for busing and bus drivers, but how much they're spending on active transportation. And it's often zero. Yeah. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to cut us off just because it's 11.45 and to keep the session just for a little more time. Um, feel free to talk to the presenters afterwards if they have a couple moments and approach them. We have lots to say, obviously. About